Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us for our first virtual Patron Circle event. Special welcome to the museum's Patron Circle members, the Symphony's Founder Society members, to all of our special guests and artists, members of the UO community, and everyone else joining us today for this special sneak peek at Metamorphosis, Visualizing Music of Paul Hindemith. I'm Danielle Knapp. I'm the Makash Curator at the Jordan Kitzer Museum of Art. And um, on behalf of our Executive Director, John Weber, and Eugene Symphony's Director, Scott Freck, and all of our colleagues who have been working on the program that we'll tell you about today, thank you so much for your interest and for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm thrilled to tell you more about the exhibition project that's in the works and also have an opportunity to talk with Francesca Leche Chong, music director and conductor of the Eugene Symphony, about his vision for this collaborative project with four Oregon visual artists, Mika Oonavoig, Anna Fiddler, Andy Myers, and Julia Oldham, all of whom are joining us today. Um, and thank you also to the staff at both the museum and the symphony and all of our partners in this project, especially for all the planning that went into um, today's event. Under normal circumstances, we would have loved to um, have invited you into the museum and to have um, had this in-person reception, to have had a gallery talk with the artists. Our original plan was to have um, Symphony's concert and our own exhibition happening this spring. Of course, our 2020 plans were disrupted, but happily, um, we will be able to push forward with plans to hopefully make all of this happen uh, even bigger and better in 2021. So. What you'll hear today is really a first behind the scenes look, look at what we've been working on and what you have to look forward to um, in the year ahead. Just to let you know too, we're planning on the exhibition happening in the Schnitzer Gallery March 6th through June 14th. So you can mark your calendars to see the artwork in person um, in the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of not too long from now. Concert details for the Eugene Symphony's performance um, as part of their C3 initiative that I think Francesca will tell you much more about are yet to be decided. So that will be announced on their website. Um, so keep an eye out and ear out for that information. So this is the JSMA's first fully digital live event. Um, we're really excited to expand into new formats to connect with our audiences. During this time, even though our doors are closed and our buildings are quiet, we're all working as hard as ever behind the scenes. Um, and so this is a great way to connect. And with it being our first time, we're also really excited to hear what kind of feedback you have about programs like this. Um, you can certainly send us feedback about our virtual patron circle reception um, after the fact via email, or we also have on Zoom, and I'm sharing right now some general recommendations to help with the Zoom experience, especially if you're not familiar with Zoom webinar. There is a chat and Q&A tool that you can use. Its default setting is um, public messages, but you can also uh, change that recipient so that you can either ask questions directly of my colleague Tiana Elkins Buckley, who will be working behind the scenes to help answer some questions. She'll also be gathering questions from the Q&A um, chat feature so that we can address audience questions at the end of the hour. Um, you can also drag the speaker panel where my face currently appears to a different position on your screen if you want an unobstructed view of the slides as we go through images. And you may also need to adjust the volume for some of the music clips that we're playing because uh, we want to make sure that as speakers' voices and music, if we, as we go back and forth, um, we're listening to everything at a comfortable volume. So just a couple of housekeeping things to keep in mind for our best enjoyment of our program. So uh, Francesco Lecce-Chan joined the Eugene Symphony in 2017. He probably doesn't need much of an introduction for many of our audience members today. Um, but when Scott Freck and Francesco reached out to the JSMA over a year ago, um, maybe two years ago now, about an idea for uh, visual arts connecting with the music of Paul Hindemith's symphonic metamorphosis of themes of Weber. Um, Jill Hartz, our director at the time, and I were so excited by their vision for this idea, the energy, um, the goals for this project, and we were really pleased to be able to recommend four artists whose work that um, we were really excited about and whose talent, and skill, and energy, and innovative ways of working felt like they would be an especially good fit for Francesco's vision for this component of a future concert. And so um, what you'll get to hear today in these 10 minute conversations with each of the artists between them and Francesco one-on-one -on -one is how they responded to the music, um, how art and music are connected, what they've been working on, and what we have to look forward to in 2021. Um, and I also wanna to mention too that behind the scenes, GSMA's design services manager, 
uh, Mike Bragg, who's been working on um, videos for three of the artists' work. We'll have four artists that correspond to the music performance. You'll hear more about that from Francesco and the artists. And so um, you may hear mention of these videos and Mike's work behind the scenes, and that's a really important part of a, compo a component of this entire um, project. So before I bring Francesco up in just a moment, and I'll stop slide, um, screen sharing for the moment while he tells us more about um, this project as a whole, if anyone also made a metamorphosized sea breeze, I cheers to you from my living room. These are really challenging times. I hope everyone's staying in good health, and I can't think of any better reason to get together virtually than um, art and music in this community. And so let's go ahead and invite Francesco to share with us a little background on this project before we get into the artist interviews. Well, thank you, Danielle, and uh, thank you to everyone at JSMA for putting this wonderful event together, and thank you all for, for joining us. Um, I, I just wanted to start off by saying what incredible collaborators uh, the museum and Danielle have been for us. Um, my process of working is usually by the time I get to the presenting part, I'm probably about 20 steps ahead of where I should be, and so usually it's just a massive idea dump. And it, it went really, it, it was just so wonderful to see it kind of all come together and um, the museum brings so many things to the table and every step of the way they've been such amazing collaborators. So thank you and thank you Danielle for uh, hosting and, and putting this event together and all the work that you've done to make this project uh, such an incredible success already and we haven't even gotten to the actual showing it. Um, so I, I again I hope everyone's staying well and and uh, you know we, we as Danielle said, we miss you all terribly and really wish we could be doing this together with you all in person. Um, but I'm really glad that we have this time together. And certainly it's, it's moments like this that, that keep me optimistic and looking towards the future. Uh, and this project in particular, I think, is, is, very, um, is very special to me because my, my mother is, a, is an artist. And so, and I actually think she's on this uh, get together today. So I'm just excited to have her here. And she was, she's a big influence on a lot of the work that I do, but especially growing up, it was always about art and music and how those things go together. And I was always so inspired by um, the work that she was doing and also a little frustrated because I will tell you that none of her abilities carried over to me on the art side. It somehow all channeled itself onto the music side. And, and you know, when we would go out sketching, it would be my, my parents with their paint brushes and their pencils and I would be there with like a music score uh, just so I felt like I belonged. Uh, at any rate, um, you know, it's, it's something that's always been part of my life. And perhaps those of you that um, came to see our project, The Color of Sound, the, uh, that the Eugene Symphony did, a massive project that we did last season, um, you probably already got a sense for how much I love thinking about how what we see affects what we hear and, and vice versa. And I think really this project is kind of taking it up another notch. Uh, and I think you'll certainly get that sense um, as we as we uh, talk more today and discuss how this project uh, came to be. On the on the big scale, this project is actually part of an entire series that the Eugene Symphony has put together, and that will happen at some point. Um, it's a project called C3, which stands for Creativity, Connection, and Community. And then on a, in its broadest scale, it's a study in all of the, cre the, the creativity that we all have, you know, whether we are um, cooking a meal, uh, writing an email, uh, you know, going on a hike, um, everything that we're doing is co we're constantly creating. And that, that is what drives us as human beings. And it's no different than the great composers that we, that we so worship. I mean, their, their experience, their need to create is the same as our need to create just in a different area. And so we wanted to look at the creativity and also how it connects us, the connection, that our ability to create is what binds us together. And then it's through those connections that we build a community. So each uh, of the concerts that we have, we have three concerts planned around each of these ideas. Um, we're going, are, are part of exploring this process. And so this project is one very important um, part of exploring the things that bind us. Uh, together, especially in the world of the arts. 
So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the music side before we launch um, into the artist's work. And we're looking at, this is a piece, Symphonic Metamorphosis of Themes by Carl Maria von Weber, which has got to be the longest title for a piece of music that is standard in the orchestral repertoire. And Paul Hindemith was born in 1895, uh, lived until 1963. He was a German composer who immigrated to the US in 1940. Um, basically his, his music was banned by the Nazi party. And so he ended up, and he had a, a Jewish wife as well. So he had to flee pretty quickly uh, in the thirties, made his way to Switzerland and then eventually to the States. Um, and he was quite well known. He immediately got a position teaching at Yale University, where he proceeded to teach the next generation of very famous American composers. Um, and then it was also in the US where he completed in uh, 1943 this uh, symphonic metamorphosis work. Now, this piece originally came about, it was supposed to be a ballet based on arrangements of music by Carl Maria von Weber. Now, Weber was a uh, uh, 19th century, you know, very typical romantic composer, very famous for writing operas. Now, the, the reason why we don't think of Weber as like, you know, one of the top echelon composers, and you're not going to hear a lot of his music besides some of his opera overtures, um, is he was great at writing melodies, like the, the kinds of melodies that get stuck in your head, um, easy to sing, easy to remember. Um, but he wasn't like a big, there was, there was no big arc to his, his music. It was very much, um, it was very dramatic, but it was also very sing-songy. And in, in some sense, if you were to isolate his melodies, they can occasionally sound rather ridiculous. And I almost wonder if that's what Hindemith was thinking when he was asked to arrange some of these um, piano pieces that Weber had written. They're very simple forehand pieces that two people can play at the piano. And Hindemith was supposed to just orchestrate them. So don't change the music, just make an orchestra be able to play it. Well, Hindemith didn't do that. He started messing around with the music and finding little ways to alter what Weber had written. So the ballet director was not too happy. Um, they parted ways and Hindemith fully embraced the idea of, of taking these themes and then finding ways to change them over time, finding new directions for them, new styles that they could uh, have. There's, there was so much that, that Hindemith could do with this music. And that's, I think, what really makes this piece so incredibly popular today and so much fun for audiences. Uh, you have this wide variety of styles reflected in each movement. Uh, Hindemith was uh, also a conductor and played several instruments. So he really deeply understood the, the instruments of the orchestra. And at its core, this piece is really a showpiece for the orchestra, um, taking its time to really show off each section and individual instruments within the orchestra. And lastly, what, perhaps what Hindemith is most famous for is not only being a teacher, but in his own music, he teaches music students. And Symphonic Metamorphosis is a piece that every music student has to inten intensely study in college because of its structure, because of the way that Hindemith took music that I get for, for our modern standards was very simple, Weber's music, where usually there was maybe two contrasting ideas and, and what we would call ABA, which was basically theme, differing theme, and then the first theme came back and that was it. And, uh, and so Hindemith's study is basically taking these very simple forms and finding very subtle and sometimes direct and in your face ways of altering that structure. Um, and it really is a study in how uh, a composer looked back 100 years, took some music, and brought it to uh, his time period. Now, the reason why I, I picked this, this, this piece for this collaboration, though, is as much as I've had to study and struggle and suffer through looking at this piece over and over and breaking it down, a lot of the work that I do that makes me realize what a genius piece this is, it's not something you're going to hear right away. As, as you first listen to it. I mean, it's a fun piece. It's, there's so uh, much there that's going on. But, uh, but ultimately, as a listener, we're being hit very fast with this, right? Because the theme keeps on coming back. It keeps on being changed. And there's so much going on that we might not catch all of the amazing things that Hindemith is doing. So part of this study was to see 
if we could work with some artists and ask them to see if they could visually depict the metamorphosis that was going on in the music. The idea is to maybe come up with a greater whole, where again, what we're seeing is affecting more strongly what we are hearing and then vice versa. And so I'm really, it's been a wonderful journey to take and so delighted to have this talk today with our great artists. But I wanted to turn it uh, back over to Danielle briefly to talk about um, how these artists came together. I know we came to you because we wanted you to help us find artists that would be excited and interested in a project like this. So I turn it back over to Danielle to maybe tell you what happened after we came to you uh, with this project and looking for artists to collaborate with. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep this really short too because I think some of this will come out in some of the conversations with the artists, but um, it's so wonderful to be asked for recommendations and ideas in response to an, um, a project like this. And of course, um, those of us who work in the arts, work in museums, we're always thinking of artists doing um, interesting work and trying to educate ourselves and discover artists who are doing interesting, timely work and whose work we should know. And um, there's always more and more artists, more creative people than we could ever hope to fit into um, museum programming. And so how can we connect people and make sure that we're trying to be part of the larger community of people who are appreciating and enjoying artist work happening? So this focus on thinking about artists who are, you know, one of our goals in talking with you early on was who are artists who are in our own community who should be um, considered for a project like this. And two of our artists are from Eugene and two are from Corvallis. And, and that's been a really nice component of this as well is to be working with artists who are sort of part of our, our circle. Um, in Willamette Valley, and um, I don't want to talk too long here because I'll introduce each of the artists um, as we go into their slides, but um, I think we found the right team for this. <laughs> so let me bring up our, um, I'll bring my screen back up again, and we can start with, um, figure out my slide share again. Great, so our first artist who's working with movement number one uh, is Andrew Myers, a visual artist in Corvallis who teaches at Oregon State University. And in his work, he explores concepts um, in, of preservation and conservation of wild places and creatures. Um, his work is drawing based, installation based, elements of sculpture and um, printmaking. And um, he's also a founding member of Grace Space. So I'll go ahead and if you'd like, I can move to the next screen and play a clip from movement one, if you'd like. I'll go backwards. <laughs> Great. Shall I take it away, Danielle? Yes, please. And I'll just move through the slides um, or let me know if you want me to advance as you're talking. Okay, let's go back for just one moment and then we'll get into this slide. All right. Um, well, Andy, thank you so much for, for joining us and being a part of this journey. Um, been so much fun. I, I love looking at this slide right here because I remember being in your studio and just kind of uh, amazed and I felt absolutely surrounded by your artwork and I could see myself right here just kind of like whoa let me take this all in for a moment. Um, it was so much fun to be able to spend some time with you and great to now start to kind of put the pieces together um, for this first movement of the Hindemith. But on a large scale to start things off, I'm just curious, um, when we first came to you th with this project, um, you know, what excited you the most? What, what kind of things were you thinking of as we first entered in um, to this collaboration? H had you had any experience with this sort of music and, and art coming together? I have done a, a couple of projects with musicians. Um, I did a series with an opera singer Work, I was drawing live while they were performing. So it was, that was similar because the music ex existed you know, it wasn't a, a total collaboration where we were kind of going back and forth. But I have done other, um, maybe more collaborative projects with composers or performers where we're kind of playing off each other, um, where I'm working and then they're composing and kind of going back and forth. So that, that really made it interesting for me because I really enjoyed those um, experiences. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, and we're, so as, you know, as we worked on this, um, what have been the things that have 
I, I don't know, maybe surprised you or interested you or fascinated you the most about this particular way of coming together um, with Hindemith's music? I think it was, you know, meeting with you a few times and talking about timing and um, how we want the work to change and relate to the music. And that was probably the biggest challenge for me, but also the, probably the thing that made it most interesting and trying to kind of put myself and make myself think like a conductor or like a composer or like a musician even, or, you know, and, and how I, my work could, you know, relate to that and, and maybe work that way rather than the way that I'm used to. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, let's, let's talk before we get into the music and how it's combined with your art. Why don't we just talk about the, these pieces that you've put together? Maybe, Danielle, we can switch over and come back to the, uh, the structure the slide a little bit later. And, and maybe just you can give us, in your own words, sort of a brief visual description of what you've put together. Um, kind of, you know, give us a sense for like size and, and what mediums you're using and your kind of overall process to create the, 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 these pieces. Sure. Yeah, it's, and some of the work it existed before, and so it was really interesting to kind of bring that in and adjust it, finish it, add new work to it, and think about how I can make it fit this project. Um, and this slide right here, you're seeing uh, some process where I'm kind of going in editing, so I'm taking, I'm covering some parts up. Um, and you can also see where it's multi-piece, so I use, this is how I work a lot. And the finished piece is bigger than that wall right there, so I have to work in, in piece by piece, and so um, that way of working is really problem solving for me. Um, it's kind of, it, there are a lot of water-based um, materials that I'm using. So you can see a lot of dripping and um, kind of randomness and chance in the mark making. And so that's really interesting to me too. So what it is, it's a, and I'm, I, in this project, I'm using the um, concepts of endangered and threatened species and extinction. And so this, this large drawing is a, extinct species, of course, a dinosaur species, an oviraptor, and then the smaller bird images are a threatened um, bird species that lives on the Oregon coast in unique ecosystems. And so the idea um, is to slowly reveal this larger drawing through these smaller silhouetted images of the marbled merlet, which is the bird that we're, we're looking at here. And so I think the next slide kind of shows that, so where that, that drawing comes through that silhouette. And so the idea is that as it's moving, it's re revealing different parts of the bigger drawing, um, maybe starting with very small, minute details and working out to bigger parts and then eventually revealing the whole um, piece. Nice, oh, that's really wonderful. Would you, you know, you, you'll have to forgive me because I don't get to interview artists all the time. So if I don't use the right terminology, you'll have to forgive me. But just, I mean, just wondering, you know, we got a, a little brief description of your work, but just wondering where you are right now as an artist and the work that you're producing. Is this um, kind of uh, representative of the work that you're really interested in right now? Did, is this work that's pushing you in a new direction? Like, where does this fall kind of in your interests right now? It touches on both of those things. I mean, it's de definitely conceptually is what I work with work with a lot of, um, like I was talking about, like native and kind of endangered, threatened species, those kind of things. Um, extinction is really interesting, you know, and kind of how that's relating to where we are in the world today. And, um, but then the collaboration, of course, was, was interesting and new and working with you and working with this project in the museum. Um, really, I thrive on that collaborative energy. And so for me, this was really an exciting project. So yeah, let, let's dig in now to a little bit of, uh, of the music. You know, you heard this this little clip. Um, you know, this first movement is really kind of rough and and tough, and it it has a, a contrasting section in the middle. Um, but um, as we see here, you know, it's all about structure. And and what you're seeing on this slide right now, everyone, is essentially what I first came to each artist with. And um, you'll see the exact timing. So I had a specific recording so that they could really uh, hear exactly where transitions and changes happened uh, in the music. And um, it, it was, it's actually just kind of amazing for me to, to just geek out and be able to really talk to someone exactly about all of these little details. And, and so uh, on, first on, on, a bit, on a larger scale, Andy, um, what are the things on a, on a musical level, just like hearing it viscerally, what are the things that, that um, stuck out to you? Because I definitely, when I, when I see um, this, this dinosaur and then I see, when I hear the music, they just go so well together. Was that something that struck you as well right away? 
No, no. actually it was, that was probably the challenging part was thinking about how I didn't think my work related to that piece of music enough. And so I was really struggling. Um, that, that studio visit we had together was groundbreaking for me. So the, where we talked about the kind of the reveal of a bigger piece through a smaller pieces. Um, and so that really freed me up because I was, I think I was just thinking too much about like how, how my work related to this piece of music. Um, but yeah, I think now that I look back at it, I can really see that and feel it. You know, for me, it's, you know, the kind of building up and the energy of it kind of um, relates to this, this work yeah. more than I thought it did. And, and something that you, that you said that, that really um, stuck out to me is this idea of, of the, the pieces, the building blocks. And I, I think what, one of the things I love about this project is, you know, is that each of you have created these amazing works of art, which you could stand back from and just take it all in at once or you get to jump around wherever you want to look at. Now, when we hear a piece of music, we don't get to do that. It's a, it's a linear experience where we have to put it together later or things make sense later, but not really when we first um, hear them. And I think one of the great things and one of the challenges, I think for all of us in putting this together was, how do we present your artwork in the same way so that it kind of reveals itself or it, it, it build structure over time. And I don't know if you, if you can go into a little detail maybe on, uh, I know you alluded to it a little bit earlier with the, with the birds and the silhouettes, but you know, we have kind of these, these small building block sections in the first theme within it. And then those building blocks come back a little bit later. Um, what are your thoughts on how your artwork will be presented in kind of its final form and how that will reflect on the music? Yeah, so as far as like thinking about how it comes back, um, what I'm thinking about are the marks, like the, the, there's a variety of marks in this work. And so thinking about how the, maybe the, the marks early on in, in the piece, um, where, where that, that piece of music comes back later, maybe those same type, types of marks come back later, maybe on a different scale, but they, they might have the same, maybe they're more organic or they're um, looser, or wetter or something like that. And then the um, other parts that, that feel different, maybe the marks are quite different. Um, <clears throat> scale is also something that that is going to be addressed, you know, as far as front or start to finish, but also kind of changing throughout the piece itself. Yeah, uh, it's a good time to, to you know, re-mention that, that Mike Bragg is going to be such an important part. I hope he's, he's somewhere on, on this get together. Um, it's such an important part of what we're, what we're doing because uh, we won't be revealing, you know, all, everything all at once. And there is a process um, to, to seeing all of this come together. Uh, I, I'm curious, just you know, has, has there been anything in particular that struck out as, um, as, as challenging as you listen to the music and, and thought about how all of this would go together? Like, have there been any particular challenges? I, I love what you said earlier that, you know, for me, seeing your work, I was like, first movement, you know, perfect. That's exactly what I was thinking. Um, and it's, it's interesting that for, for you, it sort of, it came, you know, about over time. It wasn't this immediate um, connection. Were there other things that, that stuck out to you in, the, in this process? Um, as far as challenges, uh, I th <laughs> like you said, like Mike's going to be a big part of this. And I think a lot of those early stressing challenges that I was um, seeing are he's going <laughs> to be dealing with. Um, and so it's th that kind of um, freed me to kind of keep throwing stuff at him, you know, and, and see what we could do with that and ideas and dif just different parts um, and just relying on his expertise to, to make that work. Um, yeah. <clears throat> like I said, like just even just the the piece of music itself for me was a challenge until you and I uh, spoke about it. Um, and, but yeah, I think i I definitely feel like it's, they work together now where I was really, I had my doubts early. Like I was, I was thinking, Oh, I don't think my work fits this piece and I don't know how to do it. But um, yeah. I feel, I feel really good about it now. Well, it, it goes so well with the idea that, um, that again, what we see can affect how we hear something and, and vice versa. And a different image would probably reflect differently on the music. And th I think this is a very exciting way these pieces come together. Um, I should mention, you know, at the end, we'll have time for Q&A with all the artists. So um, we'll keep on moving along. But thank you so much, Andy, uh, for your insights and being a part of our event today and, and looking forward to continuing this collaboration. Yeah, thank you. All right, back to you, Danielle. The artist who's working with Movement 2 is Anna Fiddler, who also lives in Corvallis and teaches at Oregon State University. 
And in Anna's recent work, she uses bold, geometric, opaque elements as a language for expressing her experience with energy. And Anna and I first met uh, years ago through a mutual friend and with one of her colleagues at OSU, Painter Julie Green. And since that time, I've had the opportunity to see Anna's work in person at different gallery shows and um, have just been really excited to follow what she's doing in her work, interested in this idea of energy portraits that she's worked with. And then very excitingly, and in tandem with what's happening with this project, her work's taken a new direction. So um, we'll go ahead and move to her first slide to listen to the music, and then I'm sure she'll tell you more about what's happening in her work recently. Well, Anna, thank you also for being a part of this project. This has been um, great fun to work with you. And certainly th this movement is the one that um, gets dissected the most in like music theory journals. Uh, it it's quite famous because it's probably the one, like I imagine if there was one movement that really annoyed the ballet director that thought he was getting Weber's music, this would be that movement um, because the Hindemith strays so far away from the original melody, which is this, um, sort of supposed to be sort of like this, this Chinese folk melody um, that Weber was trying to use in, in, in one of his operas. And then it got, ch it, it got changed actually over the years by other composers. And then Hindemith picked it up and truly transforms it. What you just heard was sort of this brass, you know, jazzy brass band version of the tune, but it has much, uh, much more straightforward um, versions of the theme as well. So this, this movement really encompasses um, so much. And um, Anna, uh, 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 just wondering as well with you, what was kind of your first impression? Um, and I'm also wondering your first impression of this piece because this movement encompasses so much. Um, what, what drew you to it? What stuck out to you with this project and, and this music? Great. I love hearing the history behind um, this piece also from you, Francesco. So I really responded to the second movement immediately um, for a couple different reasons. Music has always been really important to me. Um, long ago in my 20s, I was in a band and uh, we recorded a lot of music. We were very much influenced by early electronic music, which you'd think would not have a connection to the Hindemith piece. Um, bands like Noi and Kraftwerk and Can um, coming out of Germany actually, in my opinion, relate very much to the second movement of this Hindemith piece. Um, in terms of a transformation, um, repetition of sound um, that enters in and um, kind of leaves, um, it actually reminded me more of the music that I listen to in my studio when I'm working. Um, and I just thought the second movement was what I really wanted to work with. Well, you definitely, definitely took the, took the big chunk, but it's been really fun to see what you came up with. Um, I remember, uh, I mean, for, for each of you, what I, I just loved that it was such a surprise to see what was coming together and, and then seeing how it affected kind of the whole project, you know, for, for each one of you, what we came up with in the end. So let's skip ahead to some of the slides of your work and then maybe same thing, you can just give us a, a visual description of what we're looking at, how big these pieces are, um, the, the, the styles that you're using in it and kind of your process because um, these are, it, it's three pieces and they're connected in certain ways, um, of course, but they're, they're also quite unique. Great. So, um... The piece that we're looking at here would be, there are three distinct movements that Francesco helped me understand where they, they kind of, there are transitions in the second movement. And this um, responds to the first of those um, phases of the, of the second movement. And um, to me, the first part was very um, mysterious and I enjoyed that. And so I wanted to make a piece that responded to the energy of um, that kind of mysterious but kind of loud quality too. 
Um, and this right here is non-objective, meaning that I don't have figures. This is not um, a kind of artwork that involves anything that is in our tangible world. Instead, it's really a response to sound, right? So sound you can't see. And so, um, but I can feel it and I can experience it through color, through vibration. And this is what, um, while listening to this in various different ways in my car, in my studio, um, lying down on the floor with my eyes closed, um, this was what felt right for this. And this is um, all handmade. It's on a grid that I made by hand. And um, I use a lot of tape to get these hard edges that I'll peel away. Um, and then what's going to happen in this piece, if we could go back to the previous image, it really um, explains it. Yes, that's exactly the right one. Um, these images are going to am animate and uh, they're, they're like puzzles. So um, I worked with a colleague of mine at OSU to use a laser cutter and we made um, little pieces that cover up every single part of each of the three pieces. And then slowly, you can see my hand on that, I start to reveal by taking away a single piece. And it has this kind of kaleidoscopic feel to it. Um, so the real reveal is a transformation, just like the metamorphosis itself. Yeah, just describe your process with Mike on this because I, I wasn't there, but I can only imagine how long, because it, it was almost, we're, we're almost taking a photo like what we see here, but like every single time you take away one piece. That's right. So um, what Mike did, so he um, being the one that was actually photographing the stop motion animation, I would, um, there's a big overhead camera with lights and I would take a single piece away and he would click, take a picture. And then I would take another piece away and then click another picture. And so if you put all those together, you start to see this um, overall reveal of what, your, of what the image is. So at first you see only white with this kind of linear aspect. So you have a clue as to what's about to happen, but then the color is what the big reveal would be. Yeah. I, I've got to ask how you came up with this, because when I think about this, like, like this whole idea of, of animation and yet within a very set structure, I mean, I can't think of a more perfect way to describe this movement and what Hindemith is trying to do, because again, you don't know where the end of a section happens until it's over. And so, yes, you have these building blocks to create his piece, but you also, within those sections, things are changing. And what we're going to get with, with your art and how it's going to be revealed, essentially, is the various building blocks are going to be animated and, and they're going to appear over time. But also they'll appear in a way so that we see them as a structure. I mean, it just, it kind of blows my mind how well these two things go together. Um, is this something you've done before with other art pieces or it's particularly for this project? Well, um, this is a real, I don't know, breakaway from previous works that I've made. And so I've worked figuratively in the past, but um, over, I would say 20 years, I have worked with the idea of energy. And so I've called my previous works that were figurative energy portraits. They weren't portraits of people in terms of what you think of eyes, nose, mouth, et cetera. Instead, it was kind of the aura of who the person was in their lifetime. And so um, what, what this changes into is a non-figurative approach to energy. So I believe that these are energetic portraits that deal with the energy of sound. And so that's really different um, for me. And I've worked with um, the I idea of sound and animation before. Um, I mentioned I was in a band and we would often have projects with our own music that involved um, film and video and visuals. Um, so this piece right here that you're looking at is called Cape Shape. Um, Cape has to do with a particular place in Oregon on the coast, Cape Perpetua. And um, I think of this 
This is the, the end of the second movement, which is the crescendo. I've been looking at your notes, Francesco, so I know the right term. So um, this to me is almost like a map of sound. It almost looks like a compass or something in the center of it. And I, um, each individual shape, when I was actually on the Cape, Cape Perpetua, I was looking at the natural forms around me and the waves, and I was making abstractions um, using cutout forms. And so when you see some of these kind of bluish or yellow shapes, um, that's what I was looking at in the place. And I was also listening to the music while um, cutting out these abstract shapes. So, um, so this felt like the right piece for the end, the crescendo and everything kind of ignites. Yeah, it's, it's just so wonderful how each of these pieces, while they are, they use a similar technique. Um, they each reflect the diversity in the movement as well. Uh, well, uh, Anna, thank you again for, for um, giving us these insights and this really just incredible, very time intensive work, I would imagine. Uh, it's been really fun to see this come together and can't wait to keep on working with you and Mike to build these animations. So thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. So our third artist is Mika Ono, who's a multidisciplinary artist um, living in Eugene, and she currently teaches printmaking and works as a studio technician at the University of Oregon in the Department of Art. And we've worked with her at the museum on a number of projects over the years, um, specifically printmaking projects with visiting artists, including um, Rick Bartow and Wendy Redstar, Sandow Burke, and others. And so it was really delightful to have this opportunity um, to be able to work with her and her own art making and just thrilled to see what she's come up with in response to Movement 3. Well, hi, Mika, and thank you for being a part of this. It's been um, so much fun getting to know you uh, and your work. I remember particularly enjoying um, seeing your studio and, and all of the um, creations that you make out of wood blocks and, and using natural wood. And uh, that's, that's always stuck with me since that visit. And it's really exciting now to start seeing how your artwork that's going to be part of this project has now um, come out of that. So I'll, also just to start with you, kind of big picture, um, what were the things that, what, what are the things that have excited you most about um, combining your artwork with music? H have you done this sort of thing before? Um, and what's, what things have stuck out to you? Yeah, actually, I've never done anything like it. So I was especially excited to hear um, you told me there's no narrative. Um, this doesn't have a specific story, which gave me a freedom to really explore and then listen to the sound and purely like um, responding to the sound and create some artwork. Yeah, and I, and I think it really, in this movement in particular, it's the least, um, it, it, the structure is the most hidden out of all the movements. It's this, you know, gorgeous, um, uh, gorgeous music. Oh, I realize we haven't had a chance to hear it. Before I try to describe this music, uh, let's listen to a little bit of this third movement. Yeah, so there, there we go. So now we get, I don't have to try to describe it. I mean, it's just, it, it flows so beautifully. Everything's really connected. There's so many colors and textures and layers going on. Um, and it's much less angular. Well, I mean, it, it's completely not angular. It's so different than, than all the other movements. And I think you've really in, embraced that in, in your artwork. And so why don't we, let's take a look at some of your pieces and maybe you can walk us through, um, especially through your process, because actually you, I, I'm learning a lot about, about your style and, and how you work. So walk us through your process and, and then how these pieces um, are created. Mm -hmm. Um, I love doing installation, but I have a strong background in printmaking. So when I thought about responding to sound and rhythm, uh, my medium uh, printmaking was perfect because it's the, all the layerings and rhythm and then just things come together as a whole, but made sense to me. So 
uh, one part I carved a wood block, which is long, long, flowy wood block, which is about eight foot long and um, printed on the translucent paper. So it has a lot of layers. It's about 10 feet wide, like so expanding. And then, so as the um, music goes, the layer, it gets layered and layered. And um, I was, work, while, while I was working on it, I kind of imagined drawing forest almost. <laughs> so it's just like really nice, beautiful patterns just going over and over and over. Because like in my own work, I'm really interested in um, the cycle and repetition of life and then how we relate to everything else. Mm -hmm. So that's the very first part. And the second part is the, the, you know, the clip, the really beautiful, like sweeping, you know, I imagined almost like a dance move. It's like, like so sweeping and beautiful. So that's actually my brush drawing cut into the wood, like a large scale wood, and then printed over and over, but has this like, splice of color. And uh, the really, really short part, that's actually a really short bridge part. It's a tons of sounds like just happening, you know? So that was the, uh, from my ink droplets, but um, all those shapes and forms are translated, translated into screen printing. So printed in uh, over and over. And then actually this has a, a glow in the dark ink. So when the light turns off, it just a glow in the dark pops up. So that's kind of like a fun surprise. And the last part is the, um, like with the flute, a lot of flute movement. And when I was thinking about this, like really fast, a lot of like sound, I thought of this um, bark beetle and boring uh, beetle <laughs> mix on the wood bark. And I'm really into like nature insects, I love hiking. And then when I, whenever I see those like bark beetle lines, it really exciting to me. And then I thought of that pattern that beetles create was like perfect for that flute uh, movement. So I translated that um, bark beetle lines into screen printing and then combined into different formats. So I have so many pieces of these and then um, in the video piece that goes with the music, I like to have it come and going and then maybe overlay on top of those long forest because the theme one comes back with the flute. That's it. Right, right. no, it's, it's like, you. It's, it's so great. You could teach a music theory class in this movement now. <laughs> you uh, it, told exactly, me. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's so wonderful that, that this, is a, this is definitely a movement of layers. And um, I just wanted to, and I'm, I'm sorry if I don't remember correctly, but it, your, your, print, your, your printing is on many different layers. Is it like transparent paper, right? So that you can create different uh -huh. layers through that? Yes, uh, translucent pa uh, paper and also ink is mixed with translucent medium. So it kind of like, it shows through the color behind it. Okay. And then, and then a question about the the bark beetles, because when I was uh, when I was visiting with you, you were showing how you put a piece of paper directly on it to yeah. trace it. So mm -hmm. what we're looking at right now is this is this um, directly from it, or is it your interpretation of what you? What you some brought? are direct, and then some are more like um, you know I combine some other different uh, beetle patterns that I researched. So not all of them from the actual rubbing, but some are direct rubbing, some are um, combined with the different ones. Mm. And, then, and then if we can go back one slide, I'm just curious about this, this bridge. So you said you're dropping ink on the paper? So yes, the, those forms are coming from my ink drawing with the dribbles, but that is gonna be printed onto a um, translucent film and then it's burned onto a screen but I had maybe over 20 screens. So, um, and then it got printed on, on all over. That's great. So just to, just to finish up then, what, what are, um, 
what, what have been the sort of the challenging parts for you of this project? Like what are the things that have sort of pushed you to maybe try new ideas and what, what aspects of this project have been um, challenging or most interesting to you? Yeah, I just really, so first of all, I wasn't sure what to do. And then the first part was the, really a challenge, but um, I, so I just listened to it like over and over and over and over. And then once I came to this idea, then it's just a physically challenging, but otherwise um, I really enjoy the process. Well, I, I, one of the things that I, I really love about this is um, part of this project was to not, to not have it just be artwork that was inspired by music, but intensely related to what's going on. And what I, what I love is that your, your art very much reflects the, the emotions, the feelings of the music while still underpinning the structure. And I think that's also the genius of the music is that you don't have to hear the structure to appreciate it. So, um, so wonderful to have you as a part of this project. Thank you, Mika. Yeah, thank you so much. And then our fourth artist, Julia Oldham, is also a Eugene-based artist and her work expresses moments of hope in a world on the edge of collapse, environmental collapse. And she works with video, with photography and animation, and in that explores the potential um, in places where human civilization and the natural world collide, um, often uneasily. And what I love about the work that she does um, in all these different formats is that it's, all, it's so playful, but so deeply affecting as well. And so um, she's also doing double duty for this project because she's making her video. Um, so she, the type of work that she does and her skill um, in video results in a complete, complete project. Um, and not working as closely one-on-one -on -one with Mike Bragg, um, but a really amazing um, artist to bring on to end strong with Movement 4. So I'll play the clip for you here. God, I love that part. All right, well, uh, Julia, it's great to have you here to, to close out these um, four movements. And I remember really uh, enjoying that first time we, we actually got together, I think at the museum um, with your laptop and we were going over everything. And it, it was, um, I, all I remember is I think we, they, we were there like a, an hour longer than we were supposed to be. There was just so many ideas going around and um, so much that I, that I guess I didn't think about until we started even um, just talking about some ideas and your visuals that you had. And one of the things that kind of struck, uh, struck me um, in, in, in working with you is that, you know, you have this, this side where, you know, you're so involved in environmental and social aspects in your artwork. And, you know, Hindemith as a composer was very aware of what was going on around him. He actually wrote a whole opera, um, Mathis der Mahler, that was sort of a, um, a statement against um, the artistic oppression that was happening um, with the Nazis in Germany. Um, and this, this was part of the reason why his music got banned is they kind of saw through that. Um, but, you know, he, he was really in, intensely aware of what was going on ar around him. And I think, um, I, I like that there is that, that connection with your work as well, and especially these videos that you've presented for us. Um, so what were kind of your first impressions um, coming into this project and dealing with this, um, this movement that is, is it brutal in some senses? It's fun, it's exciting, uh, but it's also relentless. So kind of what were your initial impressions on this? Well, this particular movement was the one that, that really struck me as I was listening to the, the entire piece. And I thought, oh yeah, this is, this is what I want to work on. Um, as we were beginning our conversations about this project, I was in the middle of all of these projects about kind of post-apocalyptic Earth. I had recently come back from the Chernobyl exclusion zone where I had been working with the dogs there, the stray dogs there. I was about to start on this project about um, 
a sort of decaying urban wilderness in uh, Queens, New York, and I was going to be working on that that project for the whole upcoming year at the same time as making this. And so as I listened to that particular movement, I just, the image of, of a sort of falling apart, decaying world that we've completely lost control over was very present in my mind. And that kind of relentlessness was a big part of that, the sort of inexorable movement towards total destruction or whatever whatever happens at the end. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, absolutely. If, if we uh, flip to the next slide and look at the structure, I mean, just, just to show you how my mind has been opened up, this is what I showed you, right? Like the most basic level you have, um, you know, generally what seems, if you were to read this, it's a pretty uplifting movement. You have, you have these fanfares that return, and then you have these two themes that kind of alternate um, in between these these fanfares and uh, and you know looking at how we put it together with your your work it definitely and and I think it makes sense I and mean, this is 1943 for Hindemith he's just run from this horrible thing that the there's you know the the war shows no sign of ending at this point um, you know there's there's a sense um, you know for for him in this movement that I, I never really got before until we started talking about it and I saw the work that you put with it. And suddenly I saw a much darker side to his piece where it really is this, um, it, it, it is, it's sort of this persevering sense that he just, it's just like it marches on and on and on. And suddenly it's not necessarily always a, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be a celebratory march, you know? Um, and, and there were a lot of composers during this era, I think of Shostakovich that were writing music that sometimes would actually get past the censors because they thought the composers were celebrating the oppressive governments. Uh, but a lot of times, of course, it was sarcastic. It was sort of, of subversive in the way that the music um, was used. So why don't, um, if you can sort of walk us through your, the following slides and the, these are obviously gonna be stills, but they'll be, they're, they're animations that you've put together. And tell us a little bit the story that, that Hindemith tells structurally that you've now translated uh, to the artwork. Well, when you and I talked about the structure of the movement, um, we sort of, we pinpointed the, the fanfare, which comes back, I think, I think four times, and the two themes that reappear a few times as well. And so you and I talked about these three kind of parallel storylines that would be told in tiny chunks like the fan this this image here of these pipes just spilling out goo um this was the fanfare storyline so every time the fanfare came back more goo had built up in this sewer world um and theme one we were i had come in with some with some samples uh of animation where the image was sinking down into an abandoned place, like uh, this abandoned airport that I found in Flushing, Queens, that is now turned into a, a wetland. Uh, that was one of the that was one of the images that uh, that I was looking at. And theme one had this the the sort of movement of notes. The notes were going down too, and so we thought theme one really fit well with these sinking storylines. Um, we have and, a slide for, do we have a slide for uh, theme one? Yeah, there should be one. Hey, there okay. is that theme one? Okay. So this is, yeah, this is theme one. This is the top of the, of what you will see as the, as the view sinks down from this moment, you go underneath a saltwater marsh and see dozens of old abandoned cars that are stacked up and that's based on a real place marine park in brooklyn uh has just been completely filled with people's stolen and abandoned cars and i was really i found that like a weirdly compelling image so that's one of the things that i was thinking about um and then theme two uh the notes are more have more of an upward movement and so uh, and so I created a couple storylines that were about things going up. So this, this still is from uh, an image of a, a high-rise building being overtaken by vines and completely eaten up. 
Um, and I created another uh, clip that's about sea level rise swallowing up a city. Uh, and so for, for all three of those sets of stories, uh, you see a, a little piece at a time until this big ending, which um, this guy was actually part of the, the sinking down movement. Um, yeah. Oh, I love that. I love our, our little <laughs> monster there. It's so great. <laughs> um, these are, I mean, this gives people just a sense. I mean, it doesn't even begin to capture how beautiful your animations are. Tell us about your process. How do you create these? Well, it's all hand drawn, but digitally. So I use a tablet and I'm drawing directly onto the surface of a tablet with a stylus. And um, it's, yeah, this is, this is what it looks like when I'm making this stuff. I'm sitting at my computer and drawing lots of um, uh, sequences of images, like old school animation, right? Uh, little tiny movements will take place in each new image until you get, you know, an animated sequence. Uh, it's pretty labor intensive. I find it very meditative working this way. There's a lot of layers for each image. I, I draw a full background first, and then I might populate it with characters uh, and other structures. Uh, and so each, each of the clips is a, is a world that I spent a lot of time creating and exploring. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's just wonderful to see how these different storylines will come together in this piece. And I love that idea that we had that I, I think is so special where literally how your animation moves reflects how the, like the, the notes and the melodies, um, the direction that they move as well. Um, I think is really just incredible. And just overall, um, what I love that we've captured this idea that, you know, there's a certain destructiveness to this, but there's beauty to that. And I think it's, it's really well conveyed in the music and then supported so nicely by your animations. Um, Julia, it's just so much fun to see this come together. I can't wait to see how all the animations get put together to tell the story. Um, thanks for being a part of this. Thank you so much. So I think now um, we can move on to our Q&A with everyone that's come to join us. Um, it's been so great having you here. And uh, I would just like to give one final shout out to um, all of our, our, our four artists. Um, they, they've each done far, far beyond what a project, an artist music project would normally entail um, and allowing me to geek out and really show them the structure and how everything's put together. Um, and I really think they've each found unique ways to convey that um, visually. Um, and I, I can, I already get goosebumps just thinking about what the experience is going to be in the hall of putting all this together. So um, with that, I guess I'll turn it back over to Danielle if she wants to maybe moderate um, a Q&A with our artists. Thank you. And I want to linger just a moment longer on this slide too, just to share and thank sponsors, not just for the museum's exhibition project, which received an exhibition and documentation support grant from the Board Family Foundation, um, but also for your concert series. So just thank you for everyone, for every role you play in supporting um, programs like what we're working on, on now. Um, so we do have a little bit of time. I know we wanted to wrap up around 5.15. So we do have a little bit of time for Q&A and discussion. And I think um, one of the questions, maybe for you, Francesco, um, that we received is, if we want to spend more time with the music in advance of the concert, is there a particular recording that you would recommend? Oh, man. Um, OK, well, you know, there, there, there are so many uh, wonderful ones. Um, but I, I would have to say um, Esa Pekka Salonen has a recording with the LA Philharmonic that I think is just magnificent. I think it was the one I sent to all of our artists. Um, he's as good as it gets when it comes to this style of music, utter precision and, and such excitement and vitality in what he pulls out from the orchestra. So, but there's many, many great recordings to check out. It's a, like I said, it's one of the most popular um, orchestral works and, and it's been recorded by almost everyone. And one of the things I was thinking about too, as everyone was talking about their projects and the description of how we'll experience and maybe better understand, better appreciate the changes in the music with this linear presentation, this way we'll experience the art and music together. I love that we're able to have this exhibition component too, because in that space, all these artworks you'll see all at once. And you'll be completely in control of how much time you spend with the artwork, what you look at, you'll be able to see each artist's works, you know, depending on the view in the gallery, 
more than one at a time. And between that experience and the concert experience and then the videos themselves, just the totality of all of that, those different ways of experiencing dark music is really exciting to me. Um, I want to see if we did receive any other questions from anyone. And actually, um, and if we don't receive one, I at least want to uh, go back to something that Mika said, since I've seen the body of work she created in response to her movement and how many prints you made, you could just talk a little bit more about, um, as you were envisioning your, your response to it, if you went in with a set idea of how many prints to pull or how, what you decided, because I think you'll be the one artist in the exhibition whose complete body of work you can't show in the space, so we'll have a good representation of each of those to the four individual components you've created. But can you just talk a little bit more about sort of volume of the printmaking in response to this? Yes. Um, I guess I wasn't really planning to make such a huge body of work. It just happened naturally. And then, I mean, um, I really wanted to create something different for each movement. And then it works with the, um, how the music changes. So, and once I have this like matrix, I carve, where I, I burn screens, then I can keep repeating. And then I could try like a different combinations and different like color scheme. So ended up having more than I, more than I planned. Not a bad thing. <laughs> it's <exciting. laughs> Um, the question about how, uh, with this, will the symphony share this collaboration with schools in the area and what might that look like in terms of outreach around this? Sorry, <laughs> caught me off guard there. Can you repeat? <laughs> Sorry, just a, a question about whether this collaboration will be shared with schools in the area. Oh, I, I hope so. I'm not sure, but yeah, we've reached that point yet. I mean, the, these um, these projects are, so this is part of a, all these concerts that are very interactive. Um, so the, the idea we, we had put into place, which I can't wait till we can actually do again, um, is instead of having like a pre-concert talk before the performance, when you walk into the lobby, it's actually full of like interactive exhibits. And so you would be able to interact with some of the artwork. Um, you'd be able to meet our artists. Um, we actually, for this particular concert, we were even doing a collaboration with Insta Ballet, where we would crowdsource choreography for ballet that would be performed like right then in the concert. Um, so there was a whole bunch of things we were going to do just to get people thinking about their own creativity. Um, so I, I know we are reaching out with the educational component of this as well, because I think younger audience members would love being a part of these performances. I mean, it doesn't get it doesn't get any more interactive than this. I mean, truly we're kind of in un, unknown territory as far as really wanting to get people thinking and participating in the concert experience. Yeah, and at the museum, you know, we'll have this exhibition on view during the academic year. Of course, we don't know, none of us exactly know what the academic year might look like for K through 12 or university um, in terms of time spent in, in public places this is far enough out. I hope that everyone who wants to be able to come in the galleries and be able to see this will be able to do so. Um, but we will bring in K through 12 tours and use visual thinking strategies to encourage audiences of all ages to respond to the work. And then um, the way that we work with our university audiences as an academic museum, uh, we have wonderful curatorial interns, Zoe Kambor, who's a master's student in art history, who herself has a music background, who's working behind the scenes on exhibition planning with me. So hopefully at all levels, we'll be really sharing um, the takeaways from this and the work and the love of the music with audiences of all ages. Uh, so maybe one more question that sort of relates to this. Um, how will the music and art be coordinated between the concert hall and the museum? Well, in our original plan for this, the concert would have taken place before the exhibition would have been installed at the museum. And so the first time um, you would have seen the artwork is in its reveal through the videos that accompany the live performance. I think we still have some details to work out in terms of when Symphony knows when their, their concert will be presented this spring, but um, at least from the museum standpoint, we do plan to have music playing in the gallery, and then at some point, um, whether it's a portion of the exhibition or from the beginning of the exhibition until the end, have the videos presented in our space as well, so that it will replicate um, to some degree, but certainly not be um, you know, a substitute for the experience of the live music.
I don't know if we have if we have time, Danielle, but maybe it'd be worth just having each of the artists briefly talk about what they um, hope the experience will be in the museum of their artwork. Like, how are you picturing people interacting with your art um, in the museum itself? I'd be curious just on my end. That's a great question maybe to wrap up with as we get close to quarter after now and maybe you just want to make a few remarks in order of your movements. You'd have Anthony talk about that a little bit first. Sure. Um, I think the just seeing the actual work, I know that um, the scale and things like that are going to be maybe a little bit harder to comprehend through the projection and during the performance. So getting to interact, like Francesco was talking about, coming and standing next to the work is a very different thing than seeing it projected or photographed. Um, and even being able to see the process a little bit more, like hands-on process rather than just a digital version of it. I think will be um, really uh, a valuable part. We reserved a long wall for Andy's piece. So yeah. when we install the work in the gallery, there'll be a lot of space. Uh, that can take Dinosaur out. cells. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I guess I'm second movement. So um, I guess what I would hope is, you know, we're all working with different movements and I like the idea of a movement. And so meaning, the people in the space will be physically moving their bodies from one piece to another. And so to me, that's kind of a dynamic um, representation that kind of echoes the idea of what a movement is. So I guess I'm looking forward to that more physical representation of the work. Sorry, so for the third movement artwork, um, I'm hoping that viewers would enjoy the tactility of paper and the ink and uh, the layering, which is really difficult to portray in a video piece. So it would be nice to see like, yeah, just like Anna said, you know, physically like experience the piece would be wonderful. Thank you. Uh, my work as animation will be pretty much the exact same thing uh, projected during the performance and in the museum, but it'll obviously be, a, uh, you'll be able to experience in, it in a different way. And I, I like the idea of uh, in the museum, people being able to rewatch it if they want to and sort of find particular parts of the animation that they connect to more than others and that will be that will be possible uh that will be possible in the museum Thanks. it's gonna be good it's gonna be really good uh, i'm looking forward to seeing all this and play out and i know as we're wrapping up our time um, if other questions come up you'll be hearing more from us about the project you'll be hearing more from the artists um, we'll certainly hope to get everyone in person for events when the concert comes up and in the gallery so and this is just the beginning, but you saw it first here and we're so happy that we can share all this with you. Um, I will end with putting up a screen that just has our websites again, just so if anyone has questions about uh, events or anything we talked about today, and you can certainly get in touch with, um, with staff at either the museum or the symphony, we'll be happy to, to talk to you more. So thank you so much to our panelists, to Francesco, again, to everyone who worked on the event, to all of our supporters, and there's still some beautiful daylight left, so please um, go enjoy it, and until next time, have a wonderful evening. <laughs>